Harmon. I'm the executive director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of our organization and our partners at the wonderful Third Place Books, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream presentation with Elizabeth Lesser and Jane Fonda. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, and particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences and beyond into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we can't do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow, even host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if like me, you simply can't log enough hours on Zoom or YouTube, know that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form under the header digital media on our website. Back to tonight's program. The event will run about 30 to 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A. Jane and Elizabeth will take questions from the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. Please keep them concise and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Also know that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast or over on our YouTube page if you want to utilize that platform's closed captioning feature. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Just after tonight's event, in fact, you can join us for Roger Martin discussing the lasting societal damage inflicted by America's obsession with economic efficiency. Um, tomorrow night, come back for Howard Gardner, who established the now accepted notion of multiple intelligences with a quasi-biography tracing the development of his own mind and morality, as well as upcoming programs with Philip Norman with a new biography of Seattle guitar hero Jimi Hendrix, Charles Cupchan and Walter Russell Mead about the past and future of American isolationism, and beyond those, National Book Award finalist Tamara Payne, David Eagleman, Marion Nessel, Michael Eric Dyson, Robert Putnam, and a half a dozen programs in the 2020 Earshot Jazz Festival from our forum space. Uh, for more information about all of the above, uh, visit townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is possible through your support and the support of many sponsors. Arts and culture programs in particular are supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as many of you watching know, Town Hall is fundamentally a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching tonight's broadcast. Not going to be a newsflash to anyone. This is an unprecedented time for nonprofits, and if you're not yet a member of Town Hall and you support our mission to make ideas and inspiration accessible to the whole community, we hope you will consider joining us or making a donation tonight through the button at the bottom of your screen. And to conclude the infomercial portion of our evening, this isn't an easy time for booksellers either. And since we know you will want to spend more time with Jane and Elizabeth's books and their ideas, I urge you to buy one of each here, now, tonight, through our local and independent partners at Third Place using the conveniently positioned button, again, right at the bottom of your screen. All right. Jane Fonda is a two-time Academy Award-winning actress, author, activist, and fitness guru. It says guru, perhaps advocate, or maybe even revolutionary. Anyway, her career has spanned over 50 years, accumulating a body of film work that includes over 45 films alongside her sustained work on behalf of political causes such as women's rights, Native American rights, and the environment. She's a seven-time Golden Globe winner, the, an honorary Palme d'Or honoree, a 2014 AFI Life Achievement Award winner, and a 2019 recipient of the Stanley Kubrick Excellence in Film Award um, from BAFTA. She's currently in production for the seventh and final season of Grace and Frankie, which will be Netflix's longest running original series. Currently, Jane is leading Fire Drill Fridays, a national movement to protest government inaction on climate change. And if you're not yet familiar with Fire Drill Fridays, well, that's what Q&A sessions are for. Um, so I'm giving you first question. Hailing from one of my favorite places in this beautiful embattled country, the Hudson Valley in upstate New York, Elizabeth Lesser is a best-selling author and the co-founder of, of the Omega Institute and the Omega Women's Leadership Center. She's one of Oprah Winfrey's Super Soul 100, a collection of 100 leaders who are using their voices to elevate humanity. She's the author of several best-selling books, including Broken Open, How Difficult Times Can Help Us Grow, which sold half a million copies and was translated into 20 languages, and 2016's Marrow, Loss, Love, I'm sorry, Love, Loss, and What Matters Most, a memoir about Lesser's relationship with her sister Maggie and how they were brought closer by Maggie's cancer diagnosis. The topic of tonight's talk is both their new books, Fonda's What Can I Do? My Path from Climate Despair to Action, and Lesser's Cassandra Speaks, When Women Are the Storytellers, the Human Story Changes, as well as a discussion of why women are so powerful at simply leading the way on social change. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Lesser and Jane Fonda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us from 
all over the place, Seattle, everywhere. Uh, I can see a lot of people's chats saying hello to us. So thank you. And hi, Jane. Hi, Elizabeth. It's so nice to see you too. And thank you all for being here with us. Yeah. So um, Jane and I both have books out at the same time, and we've known each other for almost 20 years. Um, I met you, Jane, when you came to a conference that I had curated called Women in Power at my conference center in Rhinebeck, New York, Omega Institute. And um, Omega is almost 40 years old. I've been curating conferences for all this time. I usually use, um, I get a feeling like, what is disturbing the culture right now and why? And then I put a conference together. Like it can be about health, it could be about politics, it could be about poetry, anything. And then about 20 years ago, I, I sensed in my own life and in my own work life especially, when you put the words women and power together, it makes people very uncomfortable. So I thought, why? Let's do a conference about this question. And I invited a few women who speak truth to power. One was Eve Ensler, our friend, Vagina Monologues, and other creator. And I invited Anita Hill, who at that time, 20 years ago, was so in the zeitgeist of a woman speaking truth to the power at the Supreme Court. <clears throat> and uh, a couple hundred people came. It was so electric, I thought, I better do this again. And I thought, I'll invite my favorite woman in the world. I'll invite this woman who, to me, is an exemplar of trying to do power differently, Jane Fonda. I'm sure she'll say no. Why would this iconic woman who has done so much, not just as an actor, but as an activist, why would she come to our conference center? But she said yes. And as it turned out, she turned out to be the most no bullshit, graceful, kind, generous person. And we've been friends ever since. And um, when her book came out, this fall, and I read it because the title got me, How to Move from Despair to Action. And I have so much despair and I so much want to act. I just bought it and I inhaled it and I thought maybe we could do something together. So that's my story, Jane, and you might want to tell yours now. And then after we introduce ourselves, I'd like you to read something from the book. I'd love to. Um... Well, Elizabeth has described how we met, and I'm so grateful that we met. The conferences that she curated were transformative. It was very interesting to see how many powerful women were afraid to think about women in power together. And, you know, still are. It's one of the reasons that I love Elizabeth's book. Well, I love all of Elizabeth, Elizabeth's books. Her, I knew her pretty well before I read her first book, which was called Broken Open. And if you haven't read it, it's, it's, it's a fantastic book. And then Marrow. And then this new one, Cassandra Speaks, is just a wonderful book. So I jumped at the opportunity of being able to do this town hall with her. Um, Elizabeth is somebody, when people meet her, they want to keep her in their lives. And I'm so glad that she and I have stayed connected because whenever I get lost and like I feel cast adrift, um, I turn to Elizabeth and she's someone who knows how to ground people and her and herself. And so she's she's really an important person in my life. And I'm really honored to be here with you, Elizabeth. You. Um, you wanna so, read that piece that I thought was so, I'm, so um, I don't know, our books are about two different subjects it might seem, you know, women and storytelling and climate change and activism, but in a way they're very linked. Right. And this particular part of your book to me really links them. One of the things that I wanted to do, really for selfish reasons, because I wanted, I wanted to, to learn myself. When I went to DC last year for four months to carry on these weekly actions, that included civil disobedience and risking arrest. I wanted each Friday to focus on another aspect of the effects of climate change. So it would be ocean, forests, water, and women was one of them. And what I'm gonna read you is from the chapter on women. And the only critique I have of my book is 
the print is too small. I have to wear glasses to read it. All right. For thousands of years, a patriarchal paradigm has ruled. It's the paradigm that has led to the climate crisis, an extractive use up and discard mentality that treats workers, those who are different, women, and the natural world as commodities at men's disposal for their enjoyment and their profit. Around the world in countries such as Hungary, Brazil, India, the UK, Turkey, the Philippines, Russia, and even currently in the United States, we can see the apotheosis of this toxic mindset in the nationalistic tyrants, strong men, and would-be dictators. Under the millennial old patriarchal rule, the feminine principle has been not destroyed, but suppressed. The spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle in his book, A New Earth, says this, oh, says this has, quote, enabled the ego to gain absolute supremacy in the collective human psyche, unquote. He says, however, that it's harder for the ego to take root in the female than in the male because women are, quote, more in touch with the inner body and the intelligence of the organism where the intuitive faculties originate, unquote, have, quote, greater openness and sensitivity toward other life forms and are more attuned to the natural world. I like to believe this is true, but I do know for sure that women have been socialized to be caregivers more attentive to others. Perhaps this has something to do with why women tend to be less susceptible to the disease of individualism, are more conscious of our physical and spiritual links to the natural world, of our interdependence, of the importance of the well-being of the community at large, not just our small personal circle. Men fear that becoming we will erase the I, the sense of self. For most women, our I has always been a little porous, whereas our we has been our superpower. I think some of this goes back to our hunter-gatherer past. Men went out to try to spear animals and bring back meat. Anthropologists have written that on the occasion the hunter did bring back meat, which was often not the case, he would give it to his family or use it to curry favor with tribal leaders. It was the reliable food, tubers, nuts, and berries gathered by women, young and old, that made up the family's daily nutrients. And if a woman's own family didn't need the food, she would distribute it to other tribal members. And if the younger women were pregnant or nursing, older women did the foraging. Grandmothers would also help with birthing, care for newborns, and were indispensable in advising the younger women about where the best water was, the juiciest berries, the poisonous insects. Survival meant respecting the interconnectedness between women. Survival meant respecting the interconnectedness between women. That's, that's critical, that sentence. They truly depend on each other, and I believe that it's baked into our DNA. This is of utmost important now, because the climate crisis we face is a collective crisis that requires collective, not individual, solutions. And the challenge is, that for the last 40 years, the idea of the collective, the public sphere, the commons, has been deliberately eroded and individualism has ridden, risen to take its place. <clears throat> but individually, we are powerless to make needed systemic change. That's why individualism works to the advantage of the relatively few who wield power. <clears throat> and that's why we need to set aside our differences, unify around our common needs, because together is how we gain power. It's women's sense of our interdependence that helps explain why we are the ones who save not just our own families, 
but our communities during extreme weather events and what allows women to rise in greater numbers to face this collective climate emergency. As Gloria Steinem says, quote, women are not better people than men. We just don't have our masculinity to prove. So that's, I that's love the passage that. that Elizabeth asked me to read. And I would in exchange, I would like you, Elizabeth, to read the chapter called Vivere Militare Est. Okay, I'll read a little bit of it so we can have our conversation. I'll read about five minutes worth of it. Uh, Vivere Militare Est, it's Latin. It comes uh, from the Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca who used it really as the saying of what he considered to be power, the very military, as to live is to fight. And to live is to fight has been really the, the credo of the hero in Western culture, in many cultures, but we're just talking about Western culture now. And I contend in this chapter that there are other ways to be a hero. And had women been writing the hero myths as much as men, we wouldn't just be talking about fighting as a sign of what it means to be brave, courageous, and heroic. So there's several uh, well-known contemporary writers who uh, have been writing about the feminization of the culture, and they don't mean that as a compliment. Um, this idea that masculinity is under attack when women suggest that perhaps there's another way to be a hero or to lead. So I wrote letters to some of these authors, uh, Sebastian Unger, a few others, but the person I really wanted to write a letter to was the Canadian philosopher, mythologist, Jordan Peterson. I don't know how many of you know of Jordan Peterson's work, but he has this enormous following, hundreds of thousands of people, mostly young men on YouTube, who look to him, who are, feel that their masculinity is under attack, and he writes about um, the problems with the feminization of the culture. So I wrote him a letter. It's in the book. I actually sent it to him. I'm still waiting for a reply. I wrote it about two years ago, but here it is. Dear Jordan Peterson, I would like to preface this letter by saying that what you call the feminization of our culture, I call its rebalancing. I'm not clamoring for a female-run world. I'm only stating that the world is out of balance after millennia of male-dominated leadership. Of course, humankind would be suffering from other problems if throughout history men and their talents had been relegated to a small sphere, if their sensibilities had been ignored and denigrated, if their bodies had been routinely violated, and if their creativity, intellect, and leadership had been suppressed if women's ideas, symbols, and metaphors had dominated in shaping our common history, humanity would have missed out on the great genius of the male of our species. Instead, it was women who were excluded, and in doing so, we have not only lost the genius of the female perspective, we've also suffered from an excess of the masculine, and we have prohibited both women and men from discovering their own inner balance, their full humanness. But what if there had been gender balance in the family, in education, in the arts, in the halls of power? Not only an equal ratio of women to men, but also an equal valuing as women as unique individuals and as a group. What if women's concerns, challenges, and experiences from girlhood to old age had informed life for everyone? What if feminine values and masculine values had both infused art and religion? What if women's voices had chimed in equally when the big questions were asked and answered? How should limited resources be shared and economies constructed? What should be done when conflict and evil emerge? What work is important? And how should the division of labor be organized? How can we find ways of increasing joy and diminishing suffering for all who share the earth? 
Mr. Peterson, you contend that women are wired to be agreeable and conscientious, and that men are naturally aggressive and tough. Well, why can't the core com comp why can't the core why can't I say this word? Competencies of a leader include agreeableness and conscientiousness as well as aggressiveness and toughness. Does it have to be an either or equation? Wouldn't a combination of these qualities make for a better society? If our leaders were expected to develop missing aspects of their full humanity, wouldn't that make for better relationships, less violence, and a more naturally leveled playing field? Leadership values were prescribed by the first leaders who were men for both nature and nurture reasons. But values are not set in stone. They have changed throughout human history and will continue to change, and that's a good thing. For the past hundred years, women have chosen to move beyond typecasting. We've taught ourselves how to be more assertive, how to strategize, how to negotiate, how to be more aggressive when necessary, and how to bring our agreeable, conscientious traits along with us into the workplace, into leadership, into arenas we had never entered before. Isn't it possible for men to do the same, to keep the best of their masculine traits while also learning new skills and developing different qualities that will allow them to be hands-on fathers, caretakers of older parents, emotionally intelligent members of families and groups? Isn't it so well, isn't it possible for men to stop worrying whether these traits are emasculating or shameful? Girls feel a sense of pride if they're called tomboys. Women feel accomplished when they join the ranks of male endeavors. Can boys be raised to feel pride when they exhibit more feminine qualities? And if not, why not? Why is a tomboy exalted, but a sissy is a source of shame? Why do men scorn the feminization of culture? What does this say about men's deeper feelings about the value and treatment of women? Mr. Peterson, I heard you say that we must adhere to the traditions as put forth in the old myths and stories. But people made up those stories and people can change them. The basic belief of feminism is not that women are right and men are wrong. It's merely that women are people, and therefore their voices matter, their values matter, and their stories matter. It's time for women to tell their versions of what it means to be fully human. It's time for men to respect those insights, and it's time for all of us to integrate them into a new story of power. What an absolute idiot that he hasn't responded to you. That is the most beautiful letter. That is such an important letter. I just love your book. You know, it goes, she goes to the root, to the very origin, the origin story of the demonization of women. And, you know, it's so important that people know that. And I'm so grateful to you for putting it all down the way you did. Thank you. So, yeah, I'll talk a little more about, but first I wanted to ask you, what are Fire Drill Fridays? What exactly are they? What did you do? What did you love about them? What are you still loving about them? And what surprised you about them? Um, Fire Drill Fridays are a weekly Friday um, rally. Now we're doing them virtually, but a gathering of people to talk about the uh, climate crisis and what we can do about it and how it's affecting different aspects of our lives. When we were able to be in person, they were followed by acts of civil disobedience where we risked arrest. Now, people might ask, well, why did you do that? Because that's what works. Mm -hmm. History has shown that civil disobedience is what works. It's not what you start with, but over 40 plus years, we've exhausted all the polite levers that democracy has afforded us, petitioning, writing, marching, protesting, lobbying, et cetera. And we haven't been listened to. And we know from history 
that the next step is putting your body on the line and risking getting arrested. It's what Gandhi did, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, whose picture I have right there. Oh, you can't see it here, I'll turn it. There she is, um, one of my heroes. Um, our target was the tens of millions of people in America who know there's a climate crisis and are concerned, but they haven't done anything about it because nobody's asked them. And the 13 million who are ready to do civil disobedience, but nobody's asked them. The great unasked. Fired Rule Fridays was aiming for the great unasked. And in the beginning, it was just little. We didn't, we, we just like, I thought, oh my God, I'm giving a party and nobody's coming. Um, but of course, when, a, when an 82 year old movie star gets arrested, it gets press. So there was a lot of press and media and that brought more people. And little by little, people began to come from all over the, the country. Um, and in fact, in Europe too, there were people from Europe as well. Many of them then wanted to start Fire Drill Fridays in their hometowns. And I asked them, as did Annie Leonard, because this is a project of Greenpeace. Annie Leonard is the director of Greenpeace USA. She and I both made a point of asking people, have you ever done this before? And they hadn't. So this was exactly our, our target audience. When COVID hit, we got worried that, my God, people aren't going to be paying attention to climate. But we started online virtually uh, anyway. And man, were we wrong. We are now averaging 350, 400,000 people every Friday across all social media platforms. We have touched a million, we touch a million and a half people every month. We have 15,000 plus volunteers that have been talking to almost two, two million voters around the country in swing states. We're making a difference. We're building an army. And what surprised me the most was the fact that just about every single Friday, whether whether it was um, at the rallies or the people who were arrested, two thirds were women, mostly mm. older women, which is what caused, which, which is why I wanted to read that, write that. I wanted to explain kind of why that's true, mm. why there were more women. And, and, and that's why that, that passage spe speaks to that. Um, the other thing that surprised me was how, what a transformative experience engaging in civil disobedience was for people, including myself. It's counterintuitive. You're handcuffed, you're totally in the control of the police, and you feel so liberated yeah. because and empowered. We, we don't get many chances to align our entire bodies with our deepest values. And we become whole and authentic when we do that. And it's a, it's a great feeling. And just about everybody that I talked to who, who did that and went through that for the first time felt transformed and empowered. It was really, it was very, it was special. I can tell you that it was the happiest time of my entire life and I've had a long life. I yeah. love that. There's so much in what you said that th there was just so much in there. The fact that so many of the people were women and this has been my experience working in a conference center where um, people come to learn and grow and change and be vulnerable and asks, how can I contribute to a better world? What in me needs to change in order to be the best I can be and give the most to the world? And that involves something of what you read in your piece, you know, when Eckhart Tolle talks about the ego and getting your ego out of the way, moving from this sense of me to we, to wanting to do something beyond yourself. And about 80% of the 30,000 people who come to Omega every season are women. And I've tried to figure this out and explain to myself and to others, why is it that it's women right now who are not just wanting to change the world, but also wanting to change themselves to to be congruent like what i want to be empowered so i can change power in the world so why do you think that it's mostly women and older women coming to uh fire drill fridays well here's one hormonal reason as we get older women 
our estrogen drops in relation to testosterone. So we get feistier. You know, we get a little bit more assertive. Honey, would you take the clothes to the cleaners? I'm going to my yoga class. And the men, their testosterone is dropping in relation to their estrogen. And so they'll, they're more apt to say, yeah, I'll take, I'll take the clothes to the cleaners. They become wonderful fathers or grandfathers. They become, um, well, they have more estrogen, so they become more like us. Yeah, I've, I've, heard, I've heard this from uh, male friends who have gone through um, hormone treatment for prostate cancer, and mm -hmm. they've said things like, that year that I was having to take estrogen, I was the kindest, most <laughs> conversational and connected I've ever been with my kids, with my oh, colleagues. And so when um, it just confirms for me that there is a difference between men and women. The difference isn't the problem. It's the ranking, as Gloria Steinem always says, you know, where we it's the ranking of what's more important than the other. So I like that idea that as we get older, we become more balanced. Our, our male and our females come into balance more. It's I've, I've been noticing, though, in younger people, and I wonder if you have been also, that I'm beginning to see, I see it in my sons who are incredible fathers, incredible caretakers of their children, beginning to see that balancing happening in some sectors of the society earlier. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Yes, I see it in my grandsons and I see it in my son who at 45 just they had their first child. He's a year and four months. Oh, my God. Totally. I, I, I think it's happening sooner. Um, and that's hopeful. But then it, then we ask the question, why in the midst of the, quote, feminization of the culture? Yay. Do we see the strong men all over the world rising up? Like, well, so to talk about what you think patriarchy about is under, I mean, I try to put myself in the shoes of the patriarch and, and I'm an American patriarch and I look around me and the country does not look the same. Mm -hmm. It is not the same color. I am not, I don't have the identity that I thought was mine working a good union job in a factory as my father did and my grandfather did, being able to buy a house and send my children to school. And this is all disappearing. And my, my, that goddamn Gloria Steinem has got my wife, you know, talking to me in ways that, you know, I mean, like my power is going, I'm being threatened from all sides. This is when domestic violence starts to rise. Yeah. It's the wounded beast syndrome. As I said at the first time I spoke, you know, it's very, very dangerous right now. It's why Trump is so dangerous. A wounded beast is, yeah. is gonna flail a lot and take a lot of people down on the way. And so we have to be very careful, but we have to understand that the feminist, feminine is rising and it has to, because that is what will, that balance is what will save the, the earth. Without that, it's, it's mm -hmm. we're not gonna make it. We, this is, patriarchy is not sustainable. Patriarchy is what caused the genocide of the indigenous people. It's what caused the destruction of the environment and planting monocrops and bringing African people over and then declaring them inhuman so we could justify calling ourselves a democracy. That's all patriarchal and uh, which requires a caste system. And, um, and it's what brought us fossil fuels. Yeah, and you and I share, I feel a similar way of looking at this. Like you, you, you talked about the incredible feeling of, of freedom you felt being arrested. And, and that was like the final line for you, like civil disobedience. But you, you know, civil disobedience is very different than violence and war. It's putting your life on the line without hurting anyone else. Totally nonviolent, yes. And to me, that also is about the feminine rising. But something I've always respected and loved about you and felt a, 
uh, a sense of sisterhood in is that you have a very strong inner spiritual life and you are as committed to making real radical change in the world as you are to, to compassion and kindness and grace. And that's a hard, that's a hard road to walk, to be both nonviolent and the way you just said, you put yourself in the, the shoes of the patriarch as a way of understanding as opposed to hating. So what allows you to do that? Um, what allows me to do that is self-preservation. Mm. Um, I was headed down a road that was not so good. And um, there came a point where I decided that I, I had to, um, well, I'll tell you where it started. It started at Omega with Marion Woodman. Mm. Marion Woodman, um, I, I suffered for a long time with from eating disorders, and Marion Woodman has written books about that. But she said something that's really stuck with me. Marion Woodman is a is a was the late Marion Woodman from Canada's a Freudian psychologist who spoke several times at the Omega conference. She said human beings are vessels, and the vessel needs to be full, the chalice. Yeah. And if the chalice is empty, humans will try to fill it. Food, drugs, sex, work, get it, fill it up somehow. But what we need to fill it with is spirit. It's that thing that connects us to everything in the world and in the universe. We're not meant to feel all isolated and alone. You know, I, I've been married to three alcoholics and I never could understand the third step of AA, um, your, the higher power thing. You know, I was raised an atheist and I just couldn't understand that. Marion helped me understand that. Mm. Whatever you call it, that, that spirit, the realization that we are of interconnectedness and that we're just a part of it filled me up and cured me wow it healed me and that's when i started meditating and studying buddhism and um as well as christianity and it has given me ballast mm -hmm. and how do you fill yourself up with that i meditate mm -hmm. and i but pray you go out there and join with other people. And this is what, you know, we called our thing tonight, the move, you know, the moving from me to we. And um, I just, I find that, you know, the subtitle of your book, My Path from Climate Despair to Action. To me, the, the way to move out of despair is to join with others and, um, so I'm just so... That's why we have a real advantage as women. I mean, you know, the, right now at this crossroad in human existence, it is an existential crossroad. That word has been used too much, but it is an existential crossroad. And the powers that be are trying to make us believe that we have to be individual individualism they're making they're they they i've heard denigration of the word collective oh there's that collective word again that's because we are right at the moment facing a collective crisis that requires a collective solution at a time when individualism is being exalted and women are coming along and saying together we have to be together we know it in our dna the importance of not being alone strength in numbers and, and that's, I think that that is rising now. Yeah, you know, I, I talk about this in my book, how for years, since 1930, I think, when the first research was done on asking the question, what do human beings do under stress and, and duress? And, and this researcher man, 
researched many, many people, did lots of tests and came up with fight or flight. That's what humans do under duress, except the only people used in the studies were men. So from 1930, when those studies were done until 2006, I think, when this wonderful researcher woman from uh, UCLA, Shelley Taylor said, wait a minute, I wonder what would happen if we did those, repeated those same tests of what happens under stress to human beings with women. And she did, and she found that fight, you know, you're, you're being attacked or you're stressful, you wanna fight or you flee. Then you flee either by running away or you flee through overworking or alcohol or the, any ways you're saying, you were saying, that's not what women actually do. Of course, some do, but most women tended to do what she called tend and befriend. Under duress, women tend and befriend, meaning they tend the most vulnerable. It's a terrible time. How am I going to take care of the children, the olders, elderly, the people who can't walk? I'm going to tend to them or befriend, which means how can I create a sense of belonging among the people in my circle here so that we don't have to fight each other? How can we befriend? So this isn't what always happens, but this is the instinct. This is the female instinct to tend and befriend. And I found that so fascinating that it took until 2006 to undo that idea that all humans fight or flight under stress. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I think, has the time come when we're gonna take questions from the audience? Yes, maybe. It has. Perfect, yes. So our friend can come back. And I'll, okay, I'll just give us one second, sorry. Hi, this is Josh from Town Hall. Just give me one second. That's fine, but while, while we're waiting, um, if you wanna write in the chat, any questions you wanna ask Jane or me about our books, about anything, um, please. Give us some questions. Hi, everybody. All right, then, let's see. Uh, we'll start, some of these may be things that we've glanced off of, but um, I'd like to honor um, the lot of wonderful questions we've already got in the queue. Um, Ms. Fonda, this is a question from Elizabeth. What initially prompted and informed your earliest activism? And do you have any thoughts about how your activism has grown and evolved um, over time? Okay, it, um, I was living in France. It was the 1960s. I was there all through the 60s. And um, I didn't know anything about Vietnam. I, I, I was not against the war because I didn't know anything about it. And my father had fought in the Pacific and I just assumed that wherever we were fighting, we were on the side of the angels. There were GIs by that time, by 1968, 69, there were American GIs who had turned against the war and had left Vietnam and many had come to Paris and um, they were seeking compatriots to help them out and give them recommendations for doctors and work and things like that. And so I met some of them and they started talking to me about the war. I couldn't believe what they were telling me. It was, it was our country, no, it's not possible. We couldn't be doing that. And they gave me a book by Jonathan Shell called The Village of Ben Sook. It's a small book and I read it in one sitting. And when I stood up after that, I was not the same person. I very soon after that left my family, left my husband and moved back to the United States and became a, a part of the GI movement in the United States. It was the Vietnam War. I felt betrayed as an American when I found out what was really going on there. And whenever you engage with a specific issue, if you really go into it, you discover everything. <laughs> Imperialism, racism, mm -hmm. capitalism, commodification of things, everything started to become clear. And when I flew back, and I got off the plane at the LA airport. There was the, there was this magazine called Ramparts, which was the most popular left left wing magazine in the country at the time. And there was a Native American woman with her fist in the air, better red than dead. It said on the wall behind her, and I bought it. 
and it gave the history of what we'd done to, to Americans. They had written this article, Peter Collier was his name, because the, the, the indigenous people from the Bay Area had just occupied Alcatraz. And um, so I went to Alcatraz because I wanted to understand it. And then I be, that's how I got involved in the, in the American Indian movement and the indigenous issues. The first time I was arrested was marching with indigenous people up in Tacoma. Hmm. Fort Lawton. Wow. Fort Lawton. Oh, Fort Lawton. Wow. Yeah. We were trying to occupy Fort Lawton. And, wow. and That's we were all arrested and the and the native people were beaten and I wasn't. Naturally. When what what year was that? Do you happen to recall? I can probably do some sleuthing, 1970. Wow. Uh Kara has a follow-on to that question, Jane. How do you think your think or maybe hope your activism as an older adult has inspired others? Well, you know, the fact that I'm doing this Fire Real Friday with a hit series behind me is very helpful. In the beginning of my activism, I didn't have a hit series. Um, and, and so, you know, being popular culturally is a, is a big help. Um, but I think the fact that, you know, for better or worse, and I've made plenty of mistakes, I've, I've, I've stayed, I've, I've continued. Um, you know, a lot of people, guys, cannot believe that I could get over the slings and arrows that were aimed at me in the 70s. Um, but because I wasn't alone, I was part of a movement. It was it gave me strength and I could stand up to it, you know. And so the fact that I've been involved in it for so long, I think, you know, people. People admire that people. Um, they started doing the Jane Fonda workout and it worked. Well, they, I thought they said, well, they, she told me good things then. Maybe she, what she's saying now is true. So all of those things begin to add up, you know, and I'm just about 83 years old. So there's been a long time to add it all up. And uh, I just, I don't know. I just, I just think that also I've, I've matured as has the movement, all of the different movements. We certainly saw that in the uprisings around the country after the murder of George Floyd. You know, I wondered for a moment why there was such joy in those uprisings. Yeah, there was vandalism and who knows who was doing that, but the real protesters who were there were joyful. There was singing, there was dancing, there was spoken word, there was drumming. You, Black Lives Matter was founded by women, queer women. There's a lot of women in the leadership and they want to center joy. Right. Right? Right. Absolutely. I have a couple of consecutive questions that are directed really at both of you. Um, uh, how do you let go of your anger and hold compassion for people that just shut you down and don't have space for dialogue? Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, you want to start? Sure. Um, well, it's a practice for me. It's a spiritual practice um, because I want I want to um, eradicate as much as possible um, hypocrisy in myself. If I'm just always looking outside at that person who's so bad and that person who's wrong, so wrong, it it does not contribute to the world I want. You know the the philosopher Frederick Nietzsche said, be careful when fighting monsters that you don't turn into one. And there's a real uh, chance that in the fight for justice, we start being unjust. And, you know, all you have to do is look at our country right now. This is not sustainable, that an almost equal amount of people with different opinions are so hateful toward each other that we could go to civil war. I don't want to be part of that. I want to be part of uh, trying somehow to bring us together because we won't survive if we don't. And I don't just mean America, I mean the whole world. So I take it as a serious charge to be the change, as Gandhi said, and to it's hard. I don't. I. It's not that I'm like not filled with anger and rage and outrage and thinking. You know, I hope he dies from COVID. You know, like that. It's not. It's like it's in my head a lot, but I don't want it to be there. 
So I'm constantly almost in prayer. Make me be what I want to see in the world. Can I just, I want to say two things. When I first moved from France back to the US to become an activist, and I was part of the GI movement, and outside of military bases, there were these called GI coffee houses, mostly run by women. And it was those women that made the real difference for me. They were different than any people I had ever met. They listened to me. They saw me as a person, not as a movie star. They weren't using me. They wanted to know, do you feel comfortable with, with doing this? The, the way they treated the guys, the soldiers, um, I was just taken aback because I had never seen this before. It was like looking through a keyhole at the future that we were fighting for. That more than anything else is what made me embrace the life of activism. That's one thing I want to say. Now, if I can only remember what um, the second one is. <laughs> no, but there, it'll here, come back to you. Here's the, no, here it is. I think it's important for us to realize that evil deeds, bad deeds, is that's the language of the traumatized. Right. We have to hate the deeds, but not the person who's traumatized. And when I can make myself internalize that, I feel light. Yes. When I start to hate, it weighs me down and I become the loser. Amen. We have three questions uh, <laughs> that are all around a similar theme. We're going to pivot to a couple of things that are very of the moment and, 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 and practical. Um, Candace writes, to the two of you, how do you explain women who choose to support the patriarchal eye and reject the balance of masculinity and femininity? Related, uh, Chelsea wants to know how you feel about this current Supreme Court nominee being both female and not a science supporter. And uh, the third, uh, where, where was it? Um, oh, you know what? That's enough. I'll find it later and we can- You I take the first one. Together well. Okay. Um, yeah, I've been getting this question on my virtual book tour talking about women. Uh, well, you mean Amy Coney Barrett, her too? Like she, you're, you're talking about women being the new storytellers of a better mythology for humans, her too? And I say, yes, her too. That, you know, so many of us, and I'm sure most of us watching here, consider ourselves progressives, liberals, and we um, feel good about ourselves for being inclusive and for being embracing of difference and diversity. But diversity of thought will never go away either. And if we know now that diversity of color and diversity of gender identification and diversity of age, that they're all good and must be respected, we have to respect other people's opinions and points of view. Uh, Amy Barrett is not an evil person. She may not even be a traumatized person. She has a very different point of view. So I don't want to think harm of her. Um, it's the systems that are allowing this to happen. And we have to find a way now to work the way Jane is through civil disobedience, through voting, through legal things, to change the systems. But I am not going to waste my time hating her or even thinking about her too much. Um, I, I, I have too much to do. But you write beautifully in the book about why some women are patriarch buy into the patriarchy. Right. right. Can you? Yes. Well, um, it's a risk to confront the patriarchy. It's and and many privileged women like myself. I feel. Um, the risks I've taken in my job and in my family and in my different marriages to stand up for myself as a woman and for my values, I've lost some things, but I haven't lost everything and I haven't lost my life. There are countries still, there are 
neighborhoods down the street where a woman to risk standing up to the patriarchy um, is too dangerous. And um, there, there's also goodies that you get through colluding with the patriarchy. So women are at all different levels along the way and internalized patriarchy. I have internalized patriarchy. I tell a story in the book where I like think I want my husband to be um, vulnerable and talk to me and be more yeah, awakened to his feminine. But when he does it, sometimes it scares me and I don't want him to, I want him to still be the white knight. So we all have internalized patriarchy in us, women and men, and we have to work really hard to uh, rid ourselves of it in a patient and gentle way and not to be too impatient with people who have not had the same privilege to stand their ground. Is that what you were thinking, Jane? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, especially with two of the three husbands that I've had, <laughs> I always married very strong men um, and interesting men. But um, I remember my first husband, the French guy, I was carrying a tray of drinks to a group of him and his friends, all men, all guys, one one evening. And one of the friends said, God, she's so great. She's just like a guy. I thought it was the greatest compliment I had ever received. I was whatever they wanted, they would get. It was like I, I never stood up because I thought I wouldn't be loved. Right. And in fact, I wouldn't have been loved. Mm -hmm. um, I had to be single finally at 62 before my feminism, which was theoretical, could drop into my body and I could become an embodied feminine. Because if you're in an undemocratic marriage, it's impossible to be a feminine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the two, the two uh, highest vote, the upvoted questions are both extremely practical, so I, I think we should touch on them. Cassandra wants to know how she can reduce her, how her household can reduce their footprint on a budget. And Elaine uh, asks a corollary, the Green New Deal is very broad, comment on a bipartisan bill that puts a fee on carbon and sends that money back to the people. We have thoughts about those two very different perspectives on, uh, on climate change and how we can, how we can attack it. Can't, would you repeat the first one again? I'm sorry. The question is how her household can reduce their footprint on a budget. But the first part, of, there was a first question. Oh, yeah. The, the, oh. The, the thing, yeah. Well, you know, I don't know what your means are. I don't know if, like, I live in a place where I can't put a solar panel on my roof. But if I could, I would. In the 1970s, my husband, Tom Hayden, and I had our farm was, was run on, on solar energy and a wind, a wind turbine and photovoltaic cells. You, you can generate your electricity through uh, solar energy and wind power. Um, getting, getting rid of single-use plastics and replacing it with the things that are available now. From, you know, the baggies and the straws and the cups are now made of hemp and honey, <laughs> honeycombs and I don't know what all, but they're biodegradable. Um, eating less meat is important, actually. You can cut it out altogether or cut it way back, which is what I've done. Um, I think one water is so precious. You know, don't when you turn are brushing your teeth, don't keep the water running. Rinse your thing and then turn it off while you're brushing and then turn it on again and then turn it off again. You know, they're they're little things, but we have to save water. Um one drive thing an electric car, would you uh, say? I think one thing that COVID has has been a um, byproduct, even though we don't like it and it's so dangerous, but this idea that we can be more local, we don't have to travel as much, we can find our our community where we live, and um, this idea that the the nomadic way we've been living on airplanes and cars is not sustainable, and I think a lot of us are learning like hey it's okay we can we can have the same kind of enjoyable life by being at home 
one of the things that I love about the Green New Deal is that it talks about the need to to make a lot of our um, energy generation when it becomes green and sustainable local so that local communities can actually own their energy and it doesn't have to be transported so far. Um, the Green New Deal tax, the, the question was about it was about, um, well, it's, it references a bipartisan bill that puts a carbon fee that, that then reverts money to the people. I'm not exactly sure. It seemed like they were referring to something specific that's being considered or being proposed that maybe you know, know something I about. I don't believe that it's part of the Green New Deal. Um, I don't think so either. Certainly but. Carbon, you know, carbon taxing has to be a part of the mix, but there is a bipartisan deal that's, that Sam Waterston, who, was, who I'm a friend of, and um, that's coming along now. And he kind of thought it looked interesting until he investigated further. And it turns mm. out the fossil fuel industry is behind it. Mm. You know, it's a way to keep, look, let me be perfectly blunt. The only way that we can deal with the climate crisis is to phase out fossil fuels. And they're doing all kinds of things now to try to, um, make it look like they're they're trying to solve the climate crisis but they still have a foot in the game no no matter how many wind turbines and solar panels we have if they're still drilling and fracking we're not going to make it science says we have to cut fossil fuel emissions by 2030 period end of sentence and one of the things that COVID has taught us is the importance of listening to science listening to the experts and in climate that's what the experts is saying so that means we have to stop any, we have to get the new president to stop all new fossil fuel permits, no more permits, and then gradually phase out of fossil fuels by mid-century, making sure that the communities and workers who depend on fossil fuel jobs, which are good jobs, union jobs, you can earn upwards of $100,000. For it to work, we have to be sure that those workers are trained and prepared to move to another industrial job, if that's what they want, that's also paying a hundred plus thousand dollars with the same collective bargaining rights and pensions and benefits. We, they, the oil and gas that's left in the ground is called stranded assets. The workers can never be stranded assets. It won't work. And that's another thing that's so great about the Green New Deal. We can't solve the problem if we don't solve everything together because it's not just climate, it's not the environment that's falling apart, our society is unraveling. We're having an empathy crisis. And the Green New Deal is a way to solve both at once, yeah. centering justice. It's only 14 pages long, it's not a policy, it's just a, it's an idea, it's a roadmap, it's a vision for the future. And I urge whoever asked that question, don't don't write it off without without reading it, I think, I think we can make it happen. Uh, we've got time to take, I think, three more. And I appreciate your hanging on with us just a, a little bit longer. Um, but these have all gotten a lot of uh, a lot of interest. Um, I, SJ's question is, is compelling. I love the Fire Drill Fridays and so respect your willingness to put your body on the line and getting other folks to do so as well. But do you think that is res responsibility specific to white people? Because it strikes me that people of color do not have the privilege of feeling liberated when they are put in handcuffs. Mm -hmm. Curious to hear your thoughts. Totally agree. I am very cognizant of the fact that I was treated different because I'm famous and I'm white. When I was in that jail cell, I was alone. There was no other prisoner with me. There was a guard outside my door who she was guarding me from. I don't know because nobody could get in but another guard, which is kind of creepy. I was given some kind of thing to drink and a bologna sandwich. Other prisoners, the, all the other prisoners were black and they weren't offered those same things. That's for sure. Um, so there's no question that risking arrest means something very different to people of color. But It was people of color in the South that were brave enough to risk it, you know? So that's who we're learning from. Right. Yeah. I, we've touched on this next question, um, but it's so central to the themes of both books. I feel like 
I want to give you both a chance to kind of crystallize an answer. Jan Jacobs asks, in virtually all of the issues we're touching on, we're talking about a need for systemic change. What are your perspectives about affecting systemic change? Well, if uh, sometimes when I think about systemic change, it feels so overwhelming. If I think of systems as huge and I'm just one person, it feels like the antithesis of the subtitle of Jane's book, which is uh, My Path from Despair to Action. It can feel despairing if I think I can't change the system, I'm just me. And that's why a couple of things. One, we live in this celebrity culture where we think we have to like uh, do something huge, be known, be seen, when some of the biggest changes need to happen right in our backyard. So joining the uh, school board or working in your town to make your um, streets more uh, walkable, uh, things like that, that's systemic change. If you think about it as, as the whole United States or the whole world, it's exhausting and it'll never happen. Or if you think you have to be the one and you have to make a name for yourself, that's in the wrong direction also. So I would say finding a group, tackling a change that means something to you in your area, in your town, in your office. I mean, it can be as simple as making sure there's parental leave in your workplace. And as Jane says, if you drill into one thing, you, you start seeing everything. So pick one small issue in your place of work or your town, even your family, and give it your all. And that adds up to systemic change if we're all doing it. One of my favorite chapters in my book is the one on water. And um, the main spokesperson for water is called Maud Barlow. She is Miss Water in the world. And you know her. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what she has, you know, the big problem that we're running out of water, millions of tens of millions of people already don't have clean, safe drinking water. Part of the problem is it's being privatized. This precious resource that should be a human right is being private. Wealthy people are putting it in plastic bottles and selling it to us at exorbitant prices or in cities like Detroit, where poor people can't afford to pay their water bills, the water is simply cut off, which especially during a pandemic is catastrophic. Maud is going around the world, town by city, by university, by village, helping people create blue municipalities or a blue university where this particular community decides we're gonna own our water we're gonna take it back and get rid of those bottled private profiteers. And the price of water goes down and it's a it's a win-win situation. So that's one example along the lines that, that Elizabeth has spoken of. But I think we, we don't have a lot of time. We have less than 10 years to cut our fossil fuel emissions in half. So I'm of, of a feeling that we need to create some systems change pretty damn fast. And that's where numbers matter. And that's why, you know, while I was still doing Fire Drill Fridays in D.C., the Senate Task Force on Climate Change asked to meet with me. There were about 10 senators there. And I asked them, do you think what I'm doing is the right thing or should I be doing something else? And Ed Markey said, absolutely, you're doing the right thing. You're building an army, a nonviolent army. Make it big. We need pressure from the outside. And th this is what I want to le leave with you. Let's just assume that our side wins in November, okay? This is when the work starts. Yeah. Voting is the on-ramp. It's yeah. the least we can do. It's critical. But then the work starts. You know, what happened with Obama is he had his campaign was a real movement, and people were involved, and they were working. Then he got elected, and it became a movie. Well, what is he going to do now? Oh, look what's I wonder how that's going to turn out. 
it's not a bystander. We have to stay involved and we have to build huge numbers to, if necessary, shut the government down. This has worked in history when <clears throat> unprecedented numbers of people make demands. That's what we have to do. We have to fill the streets and we have to make demands. Because I'm going to this is when her. they have to, what we have to demand has to be commensurate with the problem. And it has to be in line with what the science is saying. And we can't let, there's no honeymoon anymore. We don't have time to give any elected politician a honeymoon. This is our future. This is everything is at stake. Um, I'd like to very quickly um, pose one last question to each of you that are for, uh, coming from younger people who've been uh, who've attended tonight. And I just want to thank you. And if oh, oh, there it is. I just want to thank you both so much. Uh, before we do this, Elizabeth, can you can you take this first one? Um, newsflash: Corporate America is highly male dominated. What advice do you have for a young woman in her mid twenties trying to begin a career in male dominated corporate America? You're both such an inspiration. Any mm -hmm. thoughts for Cassandra there, Elizabeth? Yeah, Cassandra, you know, the ancient tale of Cassandra who was given the gift of prophecy, but then she was cursed and said, you will still see what's going to happen, but no one will believe you. No one will listen to you. <coughs> well, Cassandra speaks because it's time for all of us to change the ending of the Cassandra story to speak and to be listened to and to be heard. So it's risky to enter corporate America. It's risky for a young woman. You can lose your job, you can lose your reputation, you can lose everything if you are a Cassandra. But as Jane said, we don't have that much more time. It's so important and we're way more powerful than we think. And every time as a woman, I have gone out there on the line and tried to use my voice in the way that feels natural to me. It's been scary, I've felt like an imposter, but most of the time it's worked. And when it hasn't worked, I've learned big honking lessons for the next time. Now, as you said, Jane, this is often very hard for women of color, for women who can't afford to lose their jobs, so take it with a grain of salt that has to do with your own reality. But I would like to say, in most cases, courage pays off. And what, and what, if you're just getting into the corporate world just to turn in to the exact same person you don't want to turn into, what's the point? Go find another job. If you can't change it from within, don't spend your life becoming the monster you're fighting. Oh, beautiful. Uh, last question, Jane, um, is from Allison Agnew. She thanks both of you so much. She's a high school teacher of language arts, and one of her classes is American literature of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. My students are totally into it all. They wanted to know how you have sustained your level of activism and dedication. They want to be involved, but they want to know how to stay hopeful and not discouraged by the current climate. Two things my own personal transformation from a person who was uninvolved, inactive, depressed, to what I am today. So I know from my own lived experience, the human potential for transformation. But as an activist, over 50 years, I have seen numerous, I mean, I can't even count how many people, mostly women, that I have seen who have utterly changed from, I'm thinking of Lois Gibbs, shy housewife, never spoken public, terrified of a microphone, but her community and her children were being killed by pollutants from Occidental Petroleum that was bubbling up in their play yards. And by God, she turned into a warrior. That's what gives me hope. That and the young people, the millions of young people last year, all over the world, it was the largest outpouring demonstrations in the history of humankind. Whew. It was a game changer. So the young people fill me with hope. Those two things. 
the people, human capacity for transformation and young people who will not sit down and shut up because it's their future, literally a livable planet for their future that they're fighting for. Gloria Steinem always says, hope is a form of planning. And hope is so important. It's not some sort of soft Pollyanna thing. Hope and positivity and love, to me, equal courage. So I'm all about hope, even when it looks the most despairing. It's a very powerful thing. It's a fuel. It's my fuel. Um, on behalf of all of the rest of these questioners and all the people who've watched this talk tonight and or the conversation tonight and will watch it in the days to come, I want to thank you both for your leadership with heart and with clarity and with persistence. That word came up a lot in the other questions. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. I want to remind our audience that um, underneath all of these ideas and all this conviction are two books. Each of them have, have just released uh, Jane Fonda's What Can I Do? My Path from Climate Despair to Action, and Elizabeth Lesser's Cassandra Speaks, When Women are the Storytellers, the Human Story Changes. There's that green button at the bottom of your screen. Do the right thing now and stay filled with the spirit and energy that they've given us tonight um, through reading both of their texts and sharing them with people and share this talk with people. It'll be on our website for the foreseeable future. Uh, so thank you again both so much. And um, anybody who wants to stick around for Roger uh, in just a few minutes, come back and join us at 730 Thank you all very much. We'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you, Elizabeth. Bye, we're. Bye. Bye.